turning from sin, right? That's, that's an interesting concept. Um, kind of in relation to repentance, a lot of people think repentance means turning from sin. How does turning from sin go along with salvation? Do you have to turn from sin to be saved? What, what's your thought on that? You have to admit you are sinner to be saved, mm-hmm. not turn from it. Only okay. God can help you turn from it because sin can have such a grip on you uh, that unless you turn from it, uh, uh, with his help is when you can turn from it, that without his help, you can't turn from it. Don't uh, you that, think that's frustrating to a lost person to hear that they have to change their life in order to be saved? Turn from sin? Oh, I, I think it's very frustrating mm-hmm. uh, uh, because one time I led a man to Christ who was living with a woman outside of marriage. And he said, I don't know if I can give her up. Mm-hmm. And I said, God's not saying give her up and come to me. God's saying, come to me, I'll help you give her up. But you can't give her up on your own. I said, whatever you do, don't you dare go home and throw her out of your house. Because <laughs> that is so unbiblical. Because you're part yeah. of the problem. Mm-hmm. I said, but you can't take step two before you take step one. You have to come to Christ and let him figure out how to do it. Well, mm-hmm. he sincerely came to Christ. He was so overwhelmed. He went home. And she said, what's happened to you? You're so quiet. Do you want me to leave? If you do, I don't mind if we, if you want me to leave. And she left that yeah. night. Wow. Uh, God worked it all out. But wow. God, but you know, you have to, uh, uh, Galatians 2.20 says, the life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And you can, the Christian life is a supernatural life. You cannot live it. Only God can live it through you. So yeah. God, you need God's help to turn from your sin. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great example. That's awesome how God worked through that situation. Uh, what if, a what if question, what if he hadn't done that? What if they had continued to live together? Would he have been saved? If, if, they, if he sincerely trusted Christ, two things. First of all, nowhere in scripture am I called upon to determine someone else's salvation. I'm called to help them determine if they're saved. Nowhere in scripture am I ever called to determine if somebody else is saved. I'm called to help them determine if they're saved. Secondly, if he sincerely trusted Christ, he was saved. But I tell them that I got to warn you about something, that if you sincerely trust Christ and don't deal with an area of sin in your life, you'll probably be more unhappy than you are now. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Because God's going to speak to you about those areas. Yeah. And Spirit. so I, I think many times they're going to be more miserable than they are now mm-hmm. because God brought them to himself. He knows he convicts them through his Holy Spirit. But the fact of the matter is, mm-hmm. God does not make a bargain. God gives a gift. God does not say, if you do this, I'll do this for you. God says, may I give you eternal life. He will not make a bargain. He'll give a gift. A person said to me, I'm a, I don't know if I come to Christ, if I could live for him. I said, you making God like me. If you invite me for dinner, I feel like I got to invite you. But yeah. I said, God's not making a bargain. He's only giving a gift. I said, now, if you will come to Christ and not live for him, that's up to you. But I got to warn you, you're probably more miserable than you are now. Yeah. But at the same time, God's not yeah. making a bargain. He's given a gift. No strings attached. Well, that, that, brings us to an, that brings us to an important question. And um, I hear a lot of preachers fumble this. They, they talk about receiving the gospel over and over and over again. And then they never state what the gospel is. So I was wondering, Larry, if you could, in a very quick, you know, tell us what the gospel is, where it's found in scripture. Uh, First Corinthians 15, three to five, God defines the gospel. He uses four verbs. Christ died uh, as our substitute on a cross. He was buried. That's the proof that he died. He arose to prove he was the son of God and conquered sin. And he was seen. That's the proof he arose. Mm -hmm. So the four verbs are Christ died, was buried, rose, was seen. His burial is proof that he died. Back to his sins, proof that he arose. So the gospel can reduce to 10 words. Christ died for sins and rose from the dead. And I tell people, the Bible is not the gospel. The Bible contains the gospel. Yeah. The Bible is a whole lot more than the gospel. End time events. How to raise your children. How to spend your money. End time events. Mm -hmm. The Bible contains the gospel. The Bible is not the gospel. The Bible was six, six books. The gospel was 10 words. Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. When we share the gospel with something, with someone, 
there is something missing from the description of the gospel there in first Corinthians 15, one through five or three through five. And that is the substitutionary death. If that's not understood, if you, like my wife tells me all the time when we talk about this, she'll say, I believe the gospel when I was a Lutheran, I believe Jesus died for me. I believe that he rose again from the dead, but I wasn't saved. So never within that passage is the substitutionary death. Could you speak to that a little bit and tell us what your thoughts are on that? Yeah, see, I think it is there. Christ died okay. for our sins. Mm -hmm. I think that's substitution. Instead yes. okay. of on behalf of Christ died on behalf of our sins. Had he not died, you would have. So I think substitution is right there in 1 Corinthians 15. That Christ died on behalf mm -hmm. of our sins in our place. Had he not died, we would have. And frankly, where I can identify with your wife, mm -hmm. I heard for years growing up, Christ died. What mm -hmm. I never would have heard is he died for me. Had he not right. died, I would mm -hmm. have. It was a substitutionary death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And people accuse us of only, basically, we only believe the facts, right? We say to be saved, you, you only need no facts. There's no emotion involved. It's like, no, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, right? Not, not just for the world's sins, not just for that guy over there, and for your sins and for my sins. If you believe that, then you're saved, right? And it's you just head knowledge. Yeah. yeah. And that's what they say. But it's, if it's mm -hmm. personal to you, it's mm -hmm. not head knowledge or it, it does save you, right? That's what John 3, 16, that's what uh, Corinthians says. Um, very important stuff. Very important stuff. Yeah. Um, the substitutionary, we just, what we do is our church does what's called Bethlehem Walk, where, um, we basically we lead travelers throughout the city of Bethlehem, show them where Jesus was born, show how he rose, died and rose again on the third day. And then we explain that the example I like to use for the substitutionary death for them is imagine that you're David in the wilderness watching your sheep and a bear comes at you, right? That bear is God's wrath. That bear is the, um, God's punishment for your sin, hell, eternity separated from God. Uh, what Jesus did when he died on the cross is he shoved that bear out of the way and he took the brunt of the bear, right? The bear killed him. The bear hurt him. God's wrath hurt Jesus instead of it hurting us, right? We're over here safe by just accepting the gift and Jesus is over there taking the punishment for our sin, right? And that's, that's what Jesus did on the cross is he took that punishment instead of us.